in terms of how to treat these things, and I'm going to refer to this a little bit later on, I have recently dubbed it the caveman theory of medicine. Right? If you take everything that you know about medicine and you throw it out the window, you know, we go back to the days of the caveman or cavewoman, what would be the best way of getting somebody better? It's to take their own natural healing resources and pump them up and maximize them as much as possible so that they heal themselves, right? That way you don't have to introduce any foreign substances in the body. You don't have to augment anything. You don't have to put in any surgical hardware. You don't have to put them on medications. You let their body do the healing, all right? So that, in my opinion, uh, is, would be theoretically the best way of getting somebody healthy, right? Just let them do it themselves. So how the heck do we heal, right? So this is a diagram of wound healing. This process occurs virtually the same way everywhere in the body, whether you have a liver injury or you cut your finger open or you sprain a ligament or whatever. Start with the inf inflammatory phase, as I mentioned. First four to six days is inflammation. And here you get, you know, and we're, we're, you, know, you can kind of ignore these lines. These lines basically show the different types of cells that are involved in healing and that kind of thing. So you start with the inflammation. Then second phase, proliferation. Proliferation is where the scaffold is set up for the actual healing of the tissue to occur. The actual healing of the tissue is maturation. Maturation is where, for example, the collagen fibers cross-linked and strengthen and everything packs down. So this happens pretty much almost exactly the same way everywhere in the body. So as we talked about before, if you block this phase with anti-inflammatories, guess what? You're gonna be limiting how much healing you get. Well, why is the pain there in the first place? It's so that you don't do something stupid to make your injury worse, right? It's kind of like an evolutionary defense mechanism. If you sprain a ligament in your ankle, well, you need time for that to heal, so your body's gonna make it hurt so that you don't go hurt it even more, right? So you get pain there and you get healing. Well, if you take anti-inflammatories, yeah, your pain gets better so you can get back out on the soccer field and probably hurt it more, uh, but you're gonna be blunting your healing response. So what happens with repetitive injury? So one of the issues, and you know what, I apologize, I, I, I didn't mention this in the slides, but when it comes to ligaments and tendons, and this has actually been studied scientifically, which is a little bit of a scary thought, if you injure a ligament or a tendon, it never fully heals. It will mostly heal, but we know that it will heal to about 70 to 80% of its original stretching tensile strength. Now the good news is that these, these tissues are stronger than steel, so they're very, very strong. So even at 70 to 80%, the mechanical integrity is still very good, but the problem is you still have injury there, so it's still gonna be painful, because the pain nerves that are in those ligaments and tendons are still gonna be telling you, you know, yes, you know, there's still injury, there's still injury. So what happens is if you damage this area on a repetitive basis, you don't get that full repair process. And so what happens is you actually can accumulate damage over time. So if it's only sick healing to 70% every time you have an injury, well, you re-injury, you re-injure it 70%, re-injure it 70%, re-injure it, and so the accumulated injury gets worse and worse as time goes on. What happens after you sprain an ankle? It becomes easier to sprain it a second time, and a third time, and a fourth time. And unfortunately, I see these folks like, uh, you know, a lot of times, actually I see it a lot in soccer players, dancers especially, where their ligaments are, have, they've sprained their ankle so many times that the, the integrity at that point is, you know, not so good. And they have this chronic pain. This is a very small partial list of all the different types of treatments that have been tested for ligament and tendon injury. So you got everything from, you know, this extracorporeal shockwave therapy that they use to break up kidney stones, lasers, electromagnetic fields, and your more standard stuff like physical therapy. You got your acupuncture on there. Um, so lots of different things have been tried. Usually what it means if you've got five billion different things that are tried is that none of them work that well, at least nothing that's been around for a while. Each one of these can help certain people very well uh, or most people a little bit, right? But if this is something that was easy to fix, then you'd probably only have a couple of treatments and that's all you need, right? I'm gonna be focusing on these four here. Anti-inflammatories, steroid injections, prolotherapy, platelet-rich plasma. All right, let's take a look. So anti-inflammatories, and this is basically just some references that say what I've already said, which is that uh, you know, all the studies that show that, um, that acute ligament sprain pain improves never measures the ankle stability of these folks. So yes, your pain might be getting better, but we don't know if we're causing problems with the ankle stability because it's never actually been measured. 
Uh, and it's still unknown if anti-inflammatories actually change the natural history of tendinopathy or if all they're doing is just covering up the pain. Right? And uh, here, ironically, the analgesic effect of anti-inflammatories allows patients to ignore early symptoms, possibly imposing further damage on the affected tendon and delaying definitive healing. Next, steroids. What do they do? Well, this is kind of interesting. I still do a lot of steroid injections when necessary. If I had my druthers, I would treat probably 90% of folks with the regenerative therapies and reserve the steroids for things like acute bursitis, when it truly is acute bursitis or some other acute inflammatory problem like a trigger finger or something like that. That's where the steroids really can work and they can you know, provide long-term relief. But the rest of the time, the steroids will give you temporary relief. It's been studied in a lot of different areas here. Rotator cuff, elbow, I'll call it tennis elbow here, trigger finger, Achilles in the ankle, uh, the knee um, tendons, plantar fascia. Multiple systematic reviews that have reviewed all of the research out there. And basically they say that there is no good evidence to support the use of local corticosteroid injections for chronic tendon lesions. Um, yeah, uh, yes. Are cortisone shots and steroids the same thing? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. So the question is, are corticosteroid injections and cortisone and steroid, yeah, they're all synonymous. So steroid injections, corticosteroid injections, cortisone injections, all the same stuff. Yeah, thank you for, for clarifying that. Uh, and this is just one of many systematic reviews that have been published that basically all say the same thing. The notable exception is trigger finger. All right, trigger finger, the steroids actually can help uh, quite a bit with that.